Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. I'm the program manager for the Recycling Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. Today's webinar topic is Asphalt Industry Efforts in Recycling. Our presenter today is Richard Willis from the National Asphalt Paving Association, who I will introduce in a moment. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so if you have a question or comment, you can use the Q&A feature located on your control panel on your screen. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. Also, please note that the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center, its affiliates and funders, and the National Recycling Coalition assume no liability resulting from the use of any information provided during this webinar. The webinar is only provided as an informational tool and no discrimination is intended and no endorsement by these organizations is implied. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Richard Willis is NAPA's Vice President for Engineering Research and Technology and serves as their expert on mixed design, recycled materials, life cycle cost analysis, and pavement design. He serves as a staff liaison for NAPA's Committee for Asphalt Research and Technology, the Council for Engineering Research and Sustainability, Workforce Development Committee, and Pavement Economics Committee Life Cycle Cost Analysis Task Force. He's also a co-host of NAPA's Pave It Black podcast. Richard has a passion for teaching and regularly travels throughout the country to educate people on NAPA's initiatives and priorities. Before joining NAPA, Richard worked as an associate research professor at the National Center for Asphalt Te Technology in Auburn University. While at the center, he conducted research on topics related to recycled materials, sustainability, laboratory mixture characterization, and life cycle assessment. He served as a principal investigator on National Cooperative Highway Research Program Project 955 on the use of recycled asphalt shingles and asphalt mixtures with warm mix and led many asphalt industry research projects on pavement vehicle interaction. Richard holds BS degrees in physical science from Freed Hardeman University and civil engineering from Auburn University. He also holds master's and PhD, degree, PhD degrees from Auburn University. So welcome Richard and I'm gonna turn the program over to you. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here with y'all today virtually. Um, I, I do enjoy traveling around the country and speaking to people in different areas. Uh, it's been different in the last few years. I've, I've gotten to go speak at virtually at a few places I have not been able to. A few weeks ago, there was an international symposium on plastics and asphalt in Brazil. Um, but I'm happy to be with you um, from one state away virtually today. Today, we're going to talk briefly about what the asphalt industry is doing right now for recycling efforts. But first, if I want to take a moment to share with you who is NAPA? Or what is NAPA? Um, for those of you who are not aware, NAPA is the trade association which represents the asphalt industry on a national level. Um, there are local organizations. We have a, uh, a partner organization, which is the Pens Pennsylvania Asphalt Pavement Association. Um, my good friend, Charlie Goodhart, runs that organization um, in Pennsylvania, where they deal with Pennsylvania DOT related issues, counties and cities in that state, where we help those organizations, we really focus on the national efforts, such as things with the Federal Highway Administration or the US Congress or EPA, or those types of um, regulating bodies. NAPA's mission is really threefold. First is to support our members, um, to help them understand what they, what they need to run their business effectively, to get good quality for their asphalt mixtures, and how to continue to move that industry in a good direction. We advocate for the industry. And again, whether that is trying to help um, pass national legislation, which will make um, our pavements be able to last longer, uh, fund research to help us push initiatives forward, or sometimes it's working with an organization like Federal Highway Administration on e-ticketing efforts, but it's to help our industry's voice be heard on that national level. The third thing that we do is we advance the industry. We put set goals. We push ourselves to bring in new technologies, to bring in new mixed design methods or new materials that are going to improve the quality and long-term performance of our mixtures. 
And so when we look at those three things that we're doing with our mission, today we really fall in that advanced category. What are we doing to make our mixtures more recyclable or use more recycled materials or how do we make them more sustainable in these different aspects? And so as we think about this effort, I always want to reframe these conversations um, around the FHWA recycling policy. This policy was updated in 2015. And while there are five different bullets to this specific policy, there are three main points that FHWA is trying to make when someone is evaluating whether or not they should use recycled materials in their mixes. First is, how are those recycled materials going to impact the engineering of those mixes? How is it going to impact things like performance or the ability to construct it or the ability to recycle it again one day? How does it impact the economics of the mix? Is it something that because I've had to process it so much or put so much energy and effort into that, it's now actually driving the cost of the mixtures and materials up and it's going to impact me negatively in terms of my economics? You can also look at it is, well, what happens if I make a cheaper mix by using recycled materials, but it doesn't last as long? It may have impacts on the life cycle cost analysis. And then the 30 is really that environmental aspect. How is recycling going to impact my environmental benefits or is it going to impact me in a negative way? And while many people would initially say, well, of course, recycling is going to help the environment side. If I reduce the performance of the mix so much that I am now having to create and extract new raw materials over and over again or at a more rapid rate, it may not actually be the responsible thing to recycle. So to kind of help set the stage for um, what we do as an industry, I'm going to share with you a, a short video to kind of talk about one of our flagship materials that we use frequently in asphalt pavements. Aluminum and steel cans, glass and plastic bottles, the Sunday newspaper. When most people think about recycling, these are the things that immediately come to mind. But if you took all these products annually in America and put them on a scale, they would weigh less than three-fourths that of America's most recycled product, asphalt pavements. That's right. Every year, as part of road maintenance, repair, and construction activities, millions of tons of recyclable material are reclaimed and put back to use in new asphalt pavements. In fact, annually, milling old roads for recyclable materials saves about $2.8 billion. So the next time you're driving down a stretch of asphalt, don't forget to think about the green industry who paved the way. When we think about recycled materials and asphalt, the first thing that we typically discuss is reclaimed asphalt pavement. It's the material that we've been using the most. Um, we've been using it the longest. We've been actually using wrap in our mixtures for about six decades now. Now, sometimes we've been more successful than others um, in its use, and we have learned our lessons along the way through uh, trying to push it past the technology of what we had at that day and then pulling it back and then advancing again in small steps. But when you look at reclaimed asphalt pavement, there's two basic things that it is. It is rock or aggregate and it's asphalt binder. Now it's asphalt binder that could have been um, out in the sun for 20 years. It's asphalt binder that could be waste material from a plant. But it is those two simple things and we're recycling it right back into our new asphalt mixtures that we're creating. Now, the thing that we have to understand about the binder is as it is exposed to air and as it's exposed to time and UV radiation, that binder does age somewhat. So it's not going to be fresh and as new as it was the day that mix was laid or the day it was produced. But there is technology and there are ways that we're learning that we can continue to make sure that that binder is not going to negatively impact the performance of our asphalt mixtures. So one of the things that we do on an annual basis is we survey our industry and to try to understand what we do, what we're doing 
related to recycled materials. And we also uh, survey related to the use of warm mix, but we're really not gonna get into that topic today. This is a survey that we've been doing for about 10 years now. It is sponsored by the Federal Highway Administration and allows us to understand what's going on, hopefully on a state-by-state -state basis on the use of recycled materials and track how the industry is either increasing its use, plateauing, maybe decreasing, depending upon what that material is. And so you can go to our website, asphaltpavement.org, um, download these reports for free in the online store to get some of these specific data. If we look at asphalt mix and wrap tonnage over the past really 10 years, you'll see that in 2009, the industry was putting out right around 350 million tons of asphalt mix a year. Um, in 2019, that had escalated to almost 426 million tons. But if you also look at the millions of tons of wrap, you'll see that it has also continued to increase where we were only using about 55 million tons of wrap in 2009. We've gone up to over to close to 90 million tons of wrap a year in 2019. Now, if we look at that on a percentage basis, we can see that depending upon the market, wrap usage varies. In 2009, the average was a little under 15%. I remember sitting down um, with the Federal Highway Administration when I was working at NCAT and we had a cooperative agreement with them. And one of the goals was to try to advance the wrap usage in the country to where we were averaging 25%. Well, in 2019, we're not quite there yet still. We've gone from slightly under 16% to right now we're just around 21.1% uh, on average. But if you look at it, it's really that commercial and residential market that is increasing the use of RAP um, a little bit more rapidly or using higher percentages. So what does this mean for the industry? Or what does this mean for owners or, or people that are interested in reducing climate change or, uh, or looking at greenhouse gas emissions? Well, using that amount of RAP in 2019 is it basically equivalent to around 24 million barrels of liquid asphalt binder not having to be produced or 84 million tons of aggregate. And so specifically, if you put that in dollars, because most people don't, uh, when you start talking about greenhouse gases, it's ambiguous language that can sometimes be difficult to understand, but most everyone understands what a do the dollar. So we look at that, and that was $3.2 billion in material savings alone from using RAP last year. So the question you have to ask yourself in all these instances is, if I recycle, is it the responsible thing to do? Is it actually going to impact me positively from an environmental side, from an economic side, from the engineering side of things? And when you look at RAP mixture performance, there have been studies for the last six decades that have been looking at this over and over again, using different performance tests or different evaluation methods. And you can find whatever you want on Google Scholar to answer your question. However, um, there's been a lot of really good research specifically over the last 10 years that has looked at long-term performance of rat mixtures. Um, the National Center for Asphalt Technology did a study where they looked at the LTPP program or the Long-Term Pavement Performance Program um, that was being run by FHWA. And they looked and compared mixtures that had rap in them to the performance of virgin mixtures or, or mixtures that did not include any RAP. And they found out that the majority of the time the RAP mixtures compared, um, the performance of the RAP mixtures was equivalent to that of the virgin mixtures. When RAP mixtures were put out in at the NCAT test track where this, this is a um, accelerated loading facility, where in about three years they put 10 years worth of traffic on the pavements by just driving 18 wheelers around over and over and over again, all 16 hours a day um, to ensure that um, the loading gets on quickly. Because one of the biggest challenges we have in the pavements community is research takes time. And that's something we can't really accelerate unless we accelerate our traffic. When we look at the rat mixture performance, again, we see that the rat mixtures performed just as well 
as many of the virgin mixtures in the terms of field performance. So when we think about rat mixture performance, the thing we have to understand is when they are designed, produced, and constructed properly, they will perform. We're putting additional kind of checks and balances in place today to help give DOTs and owners more confidence in this performance. There's a, a process called balanced mix design where we're no longer just using kind of recipe specs, but we're taking these mixtures to laboratories and evaluating their performance to give us more confidence that they will perform in the field. There's products called recycling agents. Um, some people call them rejuvenators. We prefer the name recycling agents, but what they're supposed to do is actually change the, the characteristics of the old asphalt binder on the wrap to ensure that it is, it won't say new again, but it breathes a little bit of new life into those materials so that we get better performance. But the key to all of this is, and you're gonna hear me say this many times today, is we have to understand the materials that we're working with. We have to ensure that when we're looking at our wrap and we're looking at our other recycled materials, we do the same amount of due diligence and quality control to that material that we do to the virgin mixtures we may be getting from a quarry or the binder that we're getting from our terminals or suppliers. So again, wrap is something that we've progressed slowly with, but it is something that over time we've continued to evaluate. There's great research out there, NCHRP report 752. Um, it was really the newest national high value research project on the use of high wrap mixtures. Um, and I would highly recommend anyone research that or read that report if you're looking for kind of the state of the knowledge on high wrap mixtures. But while wrap is really the, at the kind of the forefront of what we do, there are other materials that the asphalt industry has looked at and uses and, are, and is still currently evaluating and researching. And one of those other materials is RAFs or recycled asphalt shingles. Now, the challenge that we have with RAS is if you look at this graph, in 2009, we need to think about what was happening in the country. The price of oil was going through the roof. The price of polymers and modification was going through the roof. So people decided, I can use RAS to replace some of the asphalt binder, and then it can make my mix a little bit cheaper. So what you see is from 2009 to 2011, there is a gigantic spike in the use of RAS in our asphalt mixtures. Now, in coincidence, what happened later is about 2014 and 2015, we started seeing some problems with people who had used too much RAS too quickly. There were some states that were saying you could put up to 7% RAS by weight of your mix into, the, into your asphalt mixtures. Some states even let people go as high as 10. And what we saw was then kind of a, the pendulum swung the other way, where in 2015, we started to see less and less RAS getting used. Again, why? We started seeing premature cracking in our pavements, um, specifically ones that used high amounts of RAS. When you look at the binder that you're replacing, uh, the common binder that we use in many of our modified mixtures is a PG76-22. It's modified with somewhere between 2 to 3% styrene, butadiene styrene in many ways. And when you take the asphalt that's actually on a shingle, they look very different and they behave very differently. They're a little bit more brittle. And so what happened was FHWA sent out a memorandum in 2014 talking about recycled materials and asphalt pavements and people immediately shifted most of this blame to RAS. Now, at the same time, there was a lot of research going on related to the use of RAS in asphalt mixtures. And a lot of that research said, when used appropriately, or when used in small doses, dosages, and we're talking maybe three to 5%, and it's gonna depend on whether it is a manufactured waste shingle, or whether it's the shingle that's been on your house for 20 years and you tore it off because a storm came through or had to re-roof your house. Those kind of things are going to make a difference in your performance. So when we look at where we are today on the use of RAS in our asphalt mixtures, the thing that we have to do is really focus on the quality. 
when we look at performance of our asphalt mixtures, the asphalt binder is really the driver for a lot of that, especially when we look at cracking resistance. And so when we look at the evolution of how we've designed our mixtures with RAS, we used to assume that 100% of all the binder that was in your shingle, you got and was activated and went to work in your mix. Well, there are people that started to think that RAS binder is really, really stiff. And we may not, that may not be a good assumption to make. Then people made the swing and said, well, let's start to assume that it's somewhere between 70 and 85% of the binder. And we're gonna let states kind of decide where they wanna be with that. Well, that worked for a little while. And people have started thinking about really though, how does that binder interact? And how does it work together with your new virgin asphalt binder and so people started wanting to evaluate the low temperature properties of our mixtures. And so as an owner or as a contractor, and I'm thinking, how am I going to make sure that our pavements are going to perform? And, and ideally, I would have some type of cracking test that tied to field performance so that I can say yes or no, this mixture is not going to work if I include shingles in it. But in reality, this is something we're still working on. And a lot of progress has been made over the last five years. Numerous states are looking at these balanced mix design tests and evaluating for their climate, for their distresses that they see, what works best for them. Because if we look at the volumetric properties, and that's really kind of how much do I, of uh, this material do I put in the mix and how much air does that mean it makes versus how much binders in the mix, that hasn't worked so far. When SuperPave was rolled out in the early 2000s, it was expected to come with performance tests and not just be volumetrics alone. In reality, as we've started adding more and more of these recycled materials into our mixtures, it's made us realize that some of the assumptions that we make in volumetrics may not always be valid, or they may not always be, um, they may not always be the right thing to assume. So since we don't have the cracking test figured out, and we knew that volumetrics weren't working, the direction that Ashto went was, well, let's take a binder test and have some kind of a shot. And so a property was developed called Delta TC. And when you look at low temperature performance of asphalt mixtures, there's two real properties that people look at. They look at the stiffness of the material at low temperatures, and they look at the relaxation of the material at low temperatures. And so if you found the critical temperature for stiffness and you found a critical temperature really for that relaxation, the difference between those two critical low temperatures is what they call delta TC. Now, why is this important? Think about the last time you moved, and hopefully it's been a while, but when you take your fine china, the first thing that you do is you don't just put it in a box, you wrap the mess out of that stuff with bubble wrap so that as it shifts and as it moves, the brittleness is not going to cause that to break because is it strong? Yes, but if it gets a little bit of strain on it, it breaks. I used to teach at a gym um, and I taught cycling, I taught some boxing and it was funny to see these guys that were strong as everything. Um, they could lift the house pretty much if you wanted to, but when they walked out of the gym some days and they pulled a hamstring just walking. Why? Because it was really strong, they were really stiff, but when they put out a little bit of pressure on it or pushed something in the way it wasn't supposed to go, that muscle tore. And the same thing happens with our binders when we look at some of these types of materials. We wanna make sure it is stiff, but we wanna also make sure that it can relax um, and it has that ability to not just break when it's put under a little bit of stress or strain. So that puts us in a situation where, you know, what do I have to do if I'm a contractor or what do I have to do if I'm a roadway owner to ensure that I'm probably gonna be confident that my mixtures with RAS can perform because I'm here to today to tell you they can. I've seen it, we've witnessed it, they can perform when done well, but what do I have to do? And it goes back to what I said with the wrap. We have to know our materials. We have to understand things like what is the asphalt content of that shingle? And not just what's the asphalt content, but start trying to look at, is it really, am I making a smart assumption if I'm assuming I'm getting 100% of that? The other thing that I need to know is, what are those asphalt binder properties? And the challenge that we have with many of this is, if I'm looking at asphalt binder properties, that means I have to run 
either the contractor or the owner is going to have to run some kind of chemical extraction test to get that asphalt binder. Now, while there are devices today that help you do that in a, in a safer way, um, it typically you're going to have to use chemicals that you're going to have to have hazard plans for. There, as seen earlier, sometimes you'll have to be on respirators just for safety because we want to ensure that all of our employees, all of our workers stay safe. But if we look at these five cans that are in this picture, you see the difference in these binders. That RAS binder is the stiffest binder I've ever seen in my life, but it's because it was designed to be on a roof in Alabama in the summer at an angle and have no binder movement. So it's air blown, it's stiff, it's strong. So when we use this material, we understand small doses have very finely ground RAS and have it controlled really well. I understand right now that uh, PennDOT is continuing to do research on the use of specifically tear off shingles and how to ensure that it's not going to impact quality. And I think that that's fantastic that we understand what are the steps that we need to ensure that when we recycle, we're doing it responsibly. So what else do we need to think about? Well, it's not just the RAS binder, it's how's it going to interact with the virgin binder I'm putting in the mix or the wrap that I'm actually putting into the mix because typically I'm not just putting shingles into the mix, it's gonna be my virgin aggregate, my virgin binder, some sort of, some amount of wrap and then the shingle. Binder chemistry may impact us. There's a lot of things that may impact our mix. But again, this is where, as we move towards more of those performance-based tests for our mix design, we're gonna understand how does A plus B plus C equal a good thing, or does A plus B plus C give us a mix we're not confident will perform the way we want it to. One of the things that we've really seen is we have to understand that aging is really the thing that's impacted the shingles. If you look at your manufacturer's waste versus your post consumer, sitting on that roof, being in the environment for years and years at a time really is what changes the properties of those mixtures or those brass binders. And there are some places in this country where you don't tear off the roof, you layer the roof until the roof can't structurally hold it. So when you pull those shingles off, you may have shingles that are 60, 70 years old as a part of this process. So understanding what that's going to do to the mix, characterizing how that's going to age is important because it is the same, but it's different. That shingle does have asphalt on it, but it is physically and chemically different because of those aging processes and because of the way that they were made. So what does this all mean? It means that if I'm, if I'm a contractor and I want to use shingles, should I? Yeah, it, it can perform in a mix, but it's gonna take me doing a little bit more work. It's gonna make me ask the questions of, well, to counteract that stiffer asphalt, should I use a softer binder? Should I use things like recycling agents, which we mentioned earlier? Um, and the challenge is there's some recycling agents I've seen work well with wrap that did not impact the shingle at all. And I've seen some recycling agents that work well with both. And so it's, again, it's understanding those materials. Another option would be, do I just assume I'm getting less binder and add a, from the RAS and add a little bit of extra virgin binder in there to soften it? There are states in there, counties and cities across the country that are doing all of these options to try to ensure that they get durability out of their pavements. Um, if you're interested in seeing more of what people are doing, uh, in 2019, the National Center for Asphalt Technology um, produced a synthesis document, which really showed the different methods and the different opportunities that states are using to try to improve durability. But it not just looked at what they were doing, it tried to highlight the things that were actually working. There were numerous agencies across the country that were making seven or eight changes to mixed design and testing standards all at the same time. When you make those seven or eight things, each one of those will impact how a contractor has to operate. And really, it may only be one or two of those things that are the value adds in terms of your performance. So if we look specifically at Pennsylvania, um, in 2000, 
we released our report in September of this year on recycled material use. And if we get more than three respondents from a state, we try to do some estimates on what's actually happening in the state. So we had five companies that responded in 2019 from the state of Pennsylvania. When we look at wrap usage, um, the wrap average was around 13.1%. Charlie was telling me earlier, um, it's higher than that on DOT mixes around closer to 18 or 19%, pulling you closer to kind of that national average of 21.1. 20% of the companies in Pennsylvania, so one out of those five reported using shingles. And again, we, we capture the use of warm mix as well. Um, and 100% of companies are using those. And for those of you who aren't familiar with using warm mix technology, it is a technology that allows us to reduce the temperature of our asphalt plants as we're producing our asphalt materials. So if you want more specific information of, about things like recycling agents, best practices for management of, of your wrap or RAS or using um, shingles in your asphalt mixtures, Napa does have uh, numerous documents specifically in either the qual quality improvement publication series or the information series um, that we've put out to help people understand how do I move forward with using these different types of mixtures or materials in my mixes. Moving on, there's another uh, material that we use um, not as commonly as the uh, wrap and probably not even as commonly as RAS, um, but that's recycled tire rubber. Now, one of the reasons why recycled tire rubber probably is not used as frequently today um, as one might think, you actually have to go back about 30 years to understand why. Because if we go back into the early 1990s, when Congress was developing their highway bill, they mandated the use of recycled tire rubber. Now, at that time, there were some places which were using it specifically in a, a material called asphalt rubber, which um, was had a very specific process. It was um, basically you cooked asphalt and the recycled tire rubber together at high temperatures with a high rubber content and large particles to get a certain chemical reaction. But the reality is many of the plants weren't able to use recycled tire rubber effectively because the technology hadn't produced, hadn't caught up to some of the science. People had challenges with just using the material and they weren't getting the performance that they wanted in many cases. So a few years later, Congress repealed that mandate. Um, and in 2008, when I was getting into research in this industry and people were starting to look at recycled tire rubber again, it wasn't because they wanted to. It was going back to the polymer cost spikes and the cost of binder going up. And people wanted a option if the cost of polymers ever skyrocketed again. So that was really why people started reevaluating it. But as you talked with DOTs and as you talked with some people in the agencies, they still had a sour taste in their mouth from the early 90s on the use of rubber and the, how it was rolled out. Now, when we look at our tires, they're pretty complex, though they look simple. Yeah, they, we think they've got steel, they've got textile, they've got rubber, but there's numerous types of compounds that are part of this. There's numerous different types of rubber um, that are involved in this. And understanding how those can impact our asphalt mixtures is important. So we take our tires, we put them in this type of a device, which is really like our, what's called a cracker mill, and we shred them down. Now there are other ways to do it. There's other groups that take your the tire, they freeze it with liquid nitrogen, and then they take like a hammer and they smash it to break the, the material up. But we use this in many ways to modify our asphalt mixtures. So instead of using something like a polymer, we would take this opportunity to use um, recycled tire rubber in case or as a substitute, or sometimes in combination, those are called hybrid systems. Now, there's some important things that we need to think about if I'm using wanting to use recycled tire rubber in our mixtures. And the first is really that mode of delivery. There's a, a dry process where people take that recycled tire rubber and they get it into their asphalt plants and they mix it up as they're mixing up their aggregate and their asphalt together. Then 
there's also a wet process. Now a wet process can be done on site at an asphalt plant or it can be done um, at an asphalt terminal and then shipped to the contractor like they would a typical polymer modified mix or a binder. It's important to understand that the method of delivery is going to impact the operations uh, of a contractor and maybe the, who has to be doing some of the quality control. We want to ensure that the rubber is staying in suspension, that the rubber is modifying that binder and that mix. So we have to make sure that if it is coming from a terminal, we keep it in a good homogeneous state, we pull it then into the plant well, and then we mix it with our asphalt mixtures. The other thing that we need to be thinking about is plant setup. Um, and the reason I, I bring plant setup in is because rubber falls out of suspension or actually doesn't fall out, it rises to the top. So if I have a tank of asphalt binder and I mix that rubber in with it, I have to continually be agitating that asphalt binder or that rubber will separate. Since it is lighter, it then, um, it then will rise to the top of the tank and we can, uh, it can cause separation. It can make it where you're pulling binder that may not be, have the modification that you want or you're expecting to get the performance. I kind of take it back to that Italian dressing. Um, when you let Italian dressing sit in the fridge, when you pull it out, the first thing that you have to do is shake it up to ensure that you get all the things that have the flavor throughout the entire Italian dressing. So it requires us ensuring that that process takes place to, so that the rubber is homogeneously spread throughout that asphalt binder. I also have to think about quality control. Now, if I'm pulling that rubber into the mix and it's, I'm modifying it with wrap and some other things, the challenge that I have with using rubber is I can't really do a chemical extraction on that binder to do quality control one day because the rubber itself separates and doesn't go through the chemical extraction process. So I pull all the asphalt binder out and the rubber gets left behind. So I don't know necessarily, was that rubber homogeneously spread throughout the binder? I don't know if there are any other challenges associated with that. And I don't know if I get the correct modification. So we have to figure out some way to ensure we're getting what we want. Again, a lot of this points towards moving towards testing the mixtures for quality. And whether that is in mixed design or eventually maybe one day in quality assurance, I think we're moving towards in that mixed test direction. The great thing about rubber modified mixtures is we use them everywhere. If you go across the country, they are in our gap graded mixtures, they're in our open graded mixtures, they're in our dense graded mixtures, they're in our stone matrix asphalt, open graded friction courses. They're used effectively anywhere we really need some of that bond binder modification or a stiffer mix. And so I get to decide where I want to use it and I can use it effectively in any type of mix I have available. There are other things that might impact the way that you spec or the way that you inspect your mixes. And this is something that not everyone agrees on, but if you go back to the, the first manual that was written on the use of recycled tire rubber modified mixtures, in the mix design, it said, you need to use a higher asphalt content in rubber modified mixes. Why? Because when I'm doing the asphalt content check on a rubber modified mix, if I'm putting 10% rubber in the mix on a 6% rubber modified job, 0.6% of that six is rubber and not asphalt. So I need to ensure that I have a little bit higher asphalt content because that rubber really has no binding properties. And while it modifies the binder, it does not help those particles necessarily stay together. So you might need a little bit higher asphalt content than you typically would um, in your rubber modified mixtures. And the other thing to be aware of is it will impact the way that you do your quality control and quality assurance. In many cases, it has been noted that rubber mixes, when you pull them out of the molds in the lab, so say you're running an air voids test or checking quality, pull them out of the mold and they will expand a little bit. Well, that's going to impact your air voids and any of your other calculations for your volumetric requirements. So we need to let those mixtures sit in the molds a little bit and understand that our processes will be slightly different if I'm wanting to use and move in this direction. 
But ultimately, we've seen that these mixtures can perform. They, they are a option in terms of substitution for polymers. Polymer modified asphalts are fantastic. Napa supports those wholly. Um, in fact, we just released a new document um, talking about the benefits of using polymer modification and how it can impact your performance and really your life cycle costs. But rubber modified mixtures can perform as well. Um, and they do ensure that we are diverting some of these tires from landfills um, where they have been known to cause fires or be breeding grounds for kind of mosquitoes. So the fourth thing, fourth recycled material we're gonna get into just briefly today is the use of recycled plastics and asphalt. Uh, this is a topic that two years ago really started to gain a lot of momentum. And if you actually look at the, the legislation which was passed last night in the omnibus appropriations bill, there is a study that Congress is, is giving the DOT $800,000 to turn around and talk to the National Academies to study recycled plastics and asphalt mixtures. That's on top of the other research that's happening right now. So it is a very hot topic. Um, and it's because we're, we're at an impasse right now. In 2018, China stopped taking waste plastic from other countries. We look at up to that point in the EPA release data that we were putting out close to 36 million metric tons of waste plastic a year. And we recycled about eight to 9% of that. Some of it was uh, converted into energy, but the majority of it just went to our landfills. And as China stopped taking that, it made us start to really think, what are we going to do about our plastics? About that same time, there was an explosion of information hitting social media about the use of recycled plastics and asphalt. In fact, my mom was the one who sent me a Facebook link about, have you seen this? They're talking about building roads out of plastic. And I didn't know what was going on. But then you started to see traditional media pick up these articles. You had articles in the Washington Post and The Economist talking about the use of recycled plastic and asphalt. Congress held hearings where they talked about, well, what are you doing? We, we just heard about the use of our plastics and the plastic crisis. What are y'all doing as an asphalt industry or construction industry about reusing some of these materials and recycling? The American Chemistry Council set goals on this topic. The Plastics Industry Association uh, initiated research and began reaching out to us to try to understand how this could potentially work. And I thank the Plastics Industry Association uh, for their partnership and working with us on this to try to help us understand all of these topics together. But what most people don't think about when they look at recycling plastic is they just think it's plastic. But in reality, we've got different types of plastics. We've got polyethylene terephthalate, which is kind of the water bottles or PET, high density polyethylene, PVC, LDPE, all the different polyethylenes and types of plastics that are out there, and they all have different physical and chemical properties. And understanding how do I get from low density polyethylene to an asphalt binder modifier is, is a challenge. And ensuring that as an owner, as a contractor, I can put out something that's high quality that I can get behind is important for us to be able to do. Now, if we look at in municipal solid waste, what's out there, most of the research on asphalt or plastic and asphalt has been done on either low density or high density polyethylene. And that's around 30% of the municipal solid waste plastic. When we look at some of these others, we wonder, is asphalt really even the, the best option? Or is it really where we should be going? Or is it even possible or safe? So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. We also look and the effort to continue this. Um, and when you look at plastics recycling, you've got a collection process. There's a shredding, there's a washing, decamp contamination, and there's a sorting. And we have to look at this and realize that a significant investment is needed that if we want to move in this direction, 
The infrastructure has to be built to be able to do these operations and allow us to have clean products where we can have confidence um, in their quality and that they will be good for those three E's in our asphalt mixtures. So coming from a research background, um, when I don't know what's going on, the first thing you're taught to do is do a literature review. And so luckily I'm in a position now where instead of doing the lit review, I can pay someone to do that lit review for me. We hired the National Center for Asphalt Technology to look at the research which, which has been done on the use of recycled plastics and asphalt. And they went back and found research from the early 1990s through today um, and evaluated them on a case-by-case, research-project-by-research-project basis. We saw that the majority of this research has been done in the United States. Um, some has been done in India, Malaysia. If you actually look, India is one of the few countries that has a specification for the use of waste plastic and asphalt. They use a dry process. But then you start to see a lot of countries have just started really kind of dabbling in this research where there may have only been three or four or two or a string of countries that have just done one study or published one article on it. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of that work has been done in the polyethylene family. While there have been a few on the PET, probably polypropylene, um, the majority of this work is specifically looking at polyethylenes. Again, we look at the different processes and like with rubber, we can either modify the asphalt binder and keep that plastic in suspension through a wet process, or we can introduce it into the plant via a dry process. And to be, to be completely honest, we're not 100% sure what is being done when it's in a dry process. There are some people that say the plastic will melt, it'll coat the aggregate um, and create additional friction, whereby then you're strengthening your asphalt mixture. There's some people will say, well, some of that's going to modify the binder. We're doing a proof of concept um, study at INCAT right now to try to help us understand this. But then we have a few proprietary products, no polyfault, which were around in the 90s, and then um, a few other materials, uh, an emulsion or a synthetic binder. As is expected, the majority of this stuff, uh, what, we've, what we looked at was lab testing. Whether it was binder testing, whether it was mixture testing, um, it was just looking at it through the eyes of a asphalt laboratory. There were a few studies that did look at field performance and field um, evaluations, but it was some of them were very early. There wasn't a lot that looked at long-term performance, um, and so some of that information was kind of scattered. So what I'm going to do is, is go through kind of the what we knows and what we don't know on several different topics very quickly. Um, if you have more interest specifically in understanding more about recycled plastics and asphalt, I recommend um, you come to the Pennsylvania Asphalt Pavement Association virtual conference in, in next year in January. Um, we're, we're going to do a, a short presentation specifically um, more detailed on the use of recycled plastics and asphalt. There'll be a lot of other great information at that meeting as well. But some of the things that we have to understand are how do we source these plastics? When we write specifications for our aggregates, for our other materials, for our asphalt binders, we have these specifications in place to ensure that we're going to get the quality that we want. And we need to be working with the plastics industry who understand these materials far better than I as a civil engineer um, do to help us understand what properties are important and how do I specify this to ensure I have greater confidence in the quality. I need to think about the methods of incorporation. Um, is it a binder modifier? Is it a mixture modifier? I've even seen in some places people call it a, a binder replacement. And I haven't seen a lot of research to back that up, but there are some people claiming that if I put plastic into this mix, I can actually then similar to like a wrap or a RAS mix, I can remove some of that binder out of the asphalt mixture. I need to think about how does it impact my binder characterization? Can I even run the same binder test that I would run for quality assurance with this type of material? I need to think about mixture characterization. Is it gonna impact my volumetrics? Is it gonna impact my performance? On the contracting side of things, we, 
we think about plant operations or the construction process and not a lot has been documented on how it impacts things like my plant or how it impacts what I have to do to compact it. And there was one study um, that suggested that some of these mixtures can be fairly temperature susceptible, which means they can cool off quickly. But then um, a company that's been doing this in France for numerous years has said, you just once you get the rollers on it, you can compact it pretty well. And so as we get more field information, as more demo projects have been done, we really need to document the construction process so that we can understand, is this something that I have to approach a little bit differently or is it something that same as every day, I can go on my merry way. What, some of the things that we're really starting to think about are the health and safety of our workers and that environmental piece. And I think that we have to look at that with plastics as well. When we look at the health and safety of our workers, as is this material getting blown around at our plant sites if, it, if we're doing it through the dry method and people potentially breathing it in? As I'm milling it up, um, do any microplastics get put into the air? And while this may not be a problem for 20, 30 years, it is something that we have to ensure we are not causing a problem for the future. That our wrap that we're, we recycle so much, I'm not taking 36 million metric tons of plastic out of a landfill and now putting in 82 million tons of wrap that I can't use. So we need to ensure that we're doing that right thing on the environmental side as well. And then ultimately, if you, if you talk to roadway owners, what they're looking for is performance. And there have been a lot of claims that recycled plastics in our asphalt mixtures are going to improve performance, and they very well might. But we need more data to give us that confidence. We need more data to help us know, is this a responsible recycling technique? Or is it something that's just gonna grab headlines? As we move forward the three with recycled plastics, there are three things that I'm encouraging people to do. And these are, this is kind of my mantra on this, is we've gotta have patience. And I know that's hard, but research takes time Pavements take time and we can accelerate things. We can get, try to get things done faster, but it's not gonna be something that happens overnight. It's gonna take partnership. It's gonna take the plastics industry, the asphalt industry, the, the people who understand the chemistry, the, the politicians, the lawmakers all working together to move this thing forward and answer these questions. It's also gonna take communication. And some of the things we're really good, well, sometimes we're really good at telling our success stories. But if there's a failure that happens or if there's something that didn't go quite right, we don't like to advertise that. And that's kind of human nature. But as we learn and as we do some of these experiments, some are gonna go well, some may not go so well, but we have to be willing to learn from each other. That is true partnership. That is true communication so that we don't make the same mistake 40 times. We make a mistake once and then we learn from it and we advance. That's how we can move this forward and see if we can answer those questions that really need to be answered to ensure that we allow, if this is a solution, if this is something that's great for the industry and for our pavement performance, that it has its place, its day in the sun. So we do have two documents that are on Napa's website in the online store. If you're looking at um, learning more about recycled plastics and asphalt, they're great. The first one's a state of the knowledge. It kind of, it's a, it's a shorter document where we talk a little bit about plastic recycling, the amount of plastics that are out there, um, a, a brief topical summary of lit review, the gap analysis, and then we close. And then the lit review or part B of that document is really that article by article summary of what we know and what we don't know based upon when we were working on this project. They're free for anyone. Um, I said, you just have to go to our online store to get a copy, get copies of that. And as we think about plastics and asphalt, um, and as I, we come to kind of the close of this presentation, I'm gonna share a, a short second video with you 
specifically looking at plastic. Whether you're driving to work or waiting on a delivery, roads are the arteries of America. Roads must be sustainably built and dependable. Sustainable measures aim to preserve natural resources for future generations. The asphalt pavement industry conducts research to effectively reuse old pavement, tires, paper oil, and other waste products into road. Recently, people have suggested using plastics in asphalt pavement. But not all plastic is the same. Some plastics may be easier to recycle in asphalt, and all plastic sources must be clean. So, we conduct extensive research to ensure waste materials are safe and enhance the pavement's usable life. Engineers are tackling the recyclability of plastics head-on to guarantee that we build sustainable, cost-effective, and durable pavements. With that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to try to answer any questions that people might have. Okay, Richard, great presentation. Uh, so it's, we're now gonna field some questions for Richard. If you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A feature on your control panel. Uh, we have a couple, I had a couple comments earlier. So I'll just, uh, I'll just attend these. Uh, thanks, thank you for the excellent explanation of what went wrong. Uh, with the RAS highlighting the problems with with uh, the material percentages and extreme swing of the pendulum on the use of RAS. Um, in her county, it really did get a bad rap, no pun intended. And this explanation was something the local county road commission res uh, responded to in terms of problems on certain roads uh, with RAS binders, premature cracking and spalling. So very insightful, very insightful. Um, and then uh, we might have covered this, but uh, it was asked about the uh, $800,000 funding. Is that uh, through the FW, uh, FHWA? Uh, is it a FHWA managed project? And do you know what the project will set out to prove or ascertain? So, um, so the, the language is, is still pretty vague in that. Um, and that bill, what the money is going to be given to FHWA, but then um, the actually, actually the national academies are going to be the ones that the the bill points to to actually run and kind of manage that project. And so we'll probably be looking um, to make contact with the national academies um, very probably right after the Christmas break to talk to them a little bit about this and kind of see where they're going. The, the interesting thing is the National Academies already has a um, research project that's happening right now related to the use of recycled plastics and asphalt. RFPs were due or proposals were due for that project, I think at the end of November. Um, it's specifically looking at, I believe the use of polyethylene in a dry process. And so maybe with this additional funds, they'll be able to expand some additional work and, and it, increase the scope of what they're doing. But the the language actually at first just said that it was going to look at the use of recycled plastics and infrastructure, but um, we were able to work with a few other organizations to get it to specify um, asphalt materials in that bill. Okay, thank you. Uh, what advice do you have about using wrap to make pavement by itself, uh, just placed and compacted, for example, a, a homeowner wants to use it for a driveway or a parking area? So I, I've seen people do that. Um, I, I look at that and it, it's probably fine. Um, in reality, is, is it the best value for that material? Because you're really not using um, the, the asphalt binder actively um, because you're not heating it back up. You're not really getting that. You're, you're basically making a, a gravel road out of wrap. And so I, I would say to think about the value, but if you've got massive wrap stockpiles and um, in your area, 
and you need to use it, it shouldn't be a problem. It's not going, there's no, there's, there's no like environmental or health and safety concern about using that. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. Uh, they did a, a project uh, on a local road next to me and, and I actually created a little parking area for my, one of my cars. So it, it does work. It's just, it's just a replacement for gravel. Yeah. And it does compact well and it does, it does stay in place. So yeah, I'll test to that. Uh, do you find that extended producer responsibility and or state policy is helpful in diverting more recycled materials into state and local roads? Any states that have a, any states that have done a good job on policy that incentivizes recycled content in roads? That's a question. Are there any states that have done that? So we're, we're kind of at an interesting point um, where, where engineering and policy are kind of colliding when it comes to use of recycled materials and, and mixed designs. And um, a lot of states are trying to, to wrestle with this. We, I talked a little bit today about the, the balanced mixed design concept, which is, which is, I'll show you through these tests that the mixture will perform. Um, and states are starting to do pilot projects and implement um, some very basic things regarding that. I believe the state of New Jersey developed a, a standard where they allowed people to use more recycled materials if they met these performance test specifications. Um, and so that would be one area where I think states could go is, hey, we'll allow you to use more wrap or recycle materials if you show us that it can perform using this. If you look at balanced mix design, there are really like four different methods that people are using to, to implement it. And some one set of balanced mix design or one path for it is very um, restrictive. And it basically says, I'm going to hold you up to all the volumetric requirements I've always held you to. Oh, and now I'm going to make this target even a little bit smaller by saying, here's the, and you have to meet this performance test. I, I think ultimately what you want is a mix that performs. And I hope one day we move to that place where the, the tech, we're confident enough in these tests that you leave it up to the contractor to kind of use his materials or her materials. Um, in the most cost-effective way to give you that mix that will perform. And I think that's where a lot of this is going, but it's the states right now getting comfortable with those tests and they're getting comfortable with those tests actually show you what will perform in the field. So this is a kind of a similar question. Do some states limit the amount of recycled products in their pavement and do they count wrap towards the limit? Yeah, so most um, most materials are limited, um, even to the different layers and pavements. Sometimes, uh, wrap. A lot of times, wrap and RAS are, are are lumped together, but there are some states that do it separately. And you either, they they can do it one of two ways. Some states do it through what's called a they just use a re recycled content where they might say you have no more than 25% recycled content in this mix. And the contractor may say, well, then I'll do 20% wrap and 5% RAS, or a state may say um, no more than 20% and, and they also say, and you're never gonna put more than four or 5% RAS in the mix. Um, then other places do what's called a recycled binder ratio, which, because really it's the binder that's influencing that performance. And they may say, well, you can only put 20% binder replacement in your mix or 30% binder replacement. Maybe um, because maybe that means since 20% of a shingle or 30% of a shingle is binder, that has a bigger impact in the binder replacement than 1% of a shingle in your mix versus 1% of your wrap is very different binder amounts. Um, and so using that binder ratio allows you to kind of control the impact of that shingle a little bit more closely. Okay. That's pretty much the questions. I have one here that's kind of not related to this topic, but I'll, I'm gonna ask it anyway. And this is the first I've heard of this. What do you think of the viability of solar, solar panel roads 
might have on, on the long term? Is it a gimmick or will it evolve into a useful electric generation option? Um, so I think recently one of the first public access roads, a, a solar panel road kind of went down. And the, we're, we're not endorsing it or anything. It's one of our member companies that helped develop this, but it's called the Wattway. Um, I'll be honest, I have, I have no clue. In, in terms of the viability long-term, I think it's gonna have to, we're gonna have to look at things like performance. We're gonna have to think about how does it impact, um, how is it in terms of long-term performance? Does it last a long time? I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I know the Ray, which is a, a foundation that has a spot of interstate down in Georgia has been doing some work with it. Um, I've actually gotten to see one when I visited France a couple of years ago. And um, it may have some potential. I think, I think we're gonna start seeing people, whether it's solar paneled roads or not, start to look at our roads as needing to be more multifunctional than just traffic. And whether that is generating electricity or filtering water or all kinds of different options, I, I do think we may start to see an evolution in how we view the, how our roads are supposed to just function. Okay, uh, here's one, uh, another, different one too. Uh, have you ever heard of talc powder being recycled in asphalt? I've, I've never really, I don't know a lot about that. Um, I haven't, that's something I haven't necessarily done a lot of research in. I know that there are a lot of materials that people are looking to the asphalt industry to evaluate um, as a potential in market for them. Um, beyond just some of these. And so I'm sure that if that's being talked about, it'll probably hit my desk very soon. <laughs> okay. All right, I think that's it for the question. So we're gonna wrap up here. So again, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series has been recorded and will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you'll join us for next month's webinar and please, if please visit the NRC and the RMC websites for schedule updates. And thank you again, Richard, for this great presentation. And uh, thank you for taking time out to do it. And so we're gonna sign off here. So everybody have a, a great and safe holiday season and uh, have a great day. <laughs>